Welcome PCS members and friends. Uh, today uh, we have a PCS IBS seminar. Uh, I see we have a lot of uh, visitors online also. Welcome to all of you. And we are very happy to host today Professor Maxim Goroch from ITMO University in St. Petersburg, Russia. And uh, our scientific host today is Sergei, uh, who will introduce our speaker. Okay, thank you, Tilian. Uh, Maxim uh, has started his scientific path in Belarus, in, Bel in Belarus State University, and he has graduated in 2014 as a master. And then he has, for the next three years, he was doing uh, his uh, PhD in uh, ITMO University in St. Petersburg. And after that, uh, he has become assistant professor uh, in ITMO, and uh, he focuses on various lattices, topological lattices, flat band lattices uh, in um, uh, optical lattices, but also the lattices they exist not only optical but some uh, some electrical ones. And uh, so uh, let us uh, let us start. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Sergey, for the introduction. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, so I'm happy to be here. Actually, it's my third time in IBS. First, I visited one of the workshops on topological photonics. It was. Uh, very long ago in 2019, before the pandemic, uh, so it's distant uh, past. Uh, then I was presenting at one of the IBS seminars in the autumn, but unfortunately uh, online, so being far away from here. And finally, I'm here. Uh, I would like to thank Sergei and also director Sergei Club for inviting me. Uh, today, I will, uh, I will tell you a story uh, about some uh, topological phases in the arrays of superconducting qubits. Also, we will discuss some problems of optimal control. So these sort of things uh, are currently being done in my research group uh, at Edmund University in St. Petersburg. So a couple of words about us. Uh, as, as we said, we are located in, in St. Petersburg. Uh, Edmund University is traditionally famous uh, for such areas of academic strength as computer science being, I would say, number one uh, in this area uh, in Russia, and also uh, some expertise in optics and photonics. So I'm a member of uh, the Department of Physics, uh, which pursues a number of research directions. It's, it's a very big department, so you actually see that it's more than 400 members. Uh, it publishes lots of papers, around 10 PhD defenses every year, so it's, it's a very vibrant place. Uh, and today I will present uh, some research uh, from our group devoted to topological photonics, uh, some connection with quantum technologies. However, there is a bunch of other topics which are pursued by colleagues, which I don't have a chance to, to cover in my today talk. Hopefully they will uh, be presented by some other people at some other seminars in the future. And this is my team, uh, actually not all uh, of the team, but the, the most senior people. Uh, PhD students, uh, master students, uh, some of them already graduated. For instance, Andrei Stepanenko defended his PhD thesis uh, just uh, in the autumn and now is a researcher in the United Kingdom. Uh, Daniel Bogolyuk also recently uh, defended his PhD thesis. So, and now he is uh, a researcher in France. So it's, it's really international team. On the other hand, uh, Eduardo from Mexico, he joined uh, our group uh, coming from Mexico to start PhD in Russia. So it's really international team. Good, so first of all, I, I will remind you some general concepts. Uh, some of you might be familiar with them, others don't. So sorry for repeating some basic stuff, but that's, that's important for the future. So there is one important concept called berry phase. Uh, which, which has some observable manifestation and uh, shows a connection between uh, geometric and topological concepts from one side and quantum theory from the other. So let us consider some quantum system which is described by the Hamiltonian, which depends on certain parameters. I denote them as vector R. Yes. Indeed, as people told me, this is a bit tricky. Let the laser point on. Perhaps maybe use the yeah if, if I fail yeah 
others let's try to combine the two uh, which depends on a, on a vector of parameters r then imagine that we are changing those parameters along a closed loop in the parameter space so that our system starts and finishes in the same point if the parameters are varied adiabatically, then we know from quantum theory that there is an adiabatic theorem which prohibits quantum transitions from one quantum state to another, even though the energies of those uh, levels could, could be changing uh, with the change of parameters. Therefore, after doing a loop in the parameter space, our wave function will be the same as uh, the initial wave function. Of course, on top of that, we will have some dynamic phase which is typical for the evolution of the stationary state. If you have a stationary state, it phase evolves according to this law. This is quite trivial. However, what is non-trivial and what was noticed quite long ago, so I guess 40 years by now, by Sir Michael Berry, uh, is the existence of additional geometric phase, which is called in his honor Berry phase. And this additional geometric phase, as it appears, has a profound consequences for physical systems and uh, is manifested in some observable quantities as well. By the way, uh, I'm proud uh, that I met Sir Michael Berry at one of the conferences. Uh, he is still working, quite active, uh, and we had even sort of discussion. So let us draw some geometric analogy between Berry phase from one hand and some geometric uh, quantity curvature on the other hand. So let's imagine, instead of, of parallel transport of, of, uh, of a psi function, let us consider some simple geometric picture of a parallel transport of a vector along a closed loop on a curved surface. So this is our vector. We start uh, to do a parallel transport, and mathematicians know how to define parallel transport. So you, you, put, uh, you bring it to the point R, then you do the same parallel transport from point R to point Q, and finally you transport the same vector from point Q to the initial point P. What is interesting, however, is that the reason on zero angle between the initial direction of the vector and the final direction of the vector. In differential geometry, people learn that this angle is proportional to the curvature of the surface. Actually, this is the measure how, uh, our surf how curved our surface is. And quite similar story is uh, with the body phase, and uh, this becomes especially evident if we look at some problems. So if we want to compute the phase, we need to plug in uh, this expression for the wave function into the Schrodinger equation, uh, do a couple of mathematical tricks, and then we arrive to the following expression. The Berry phase is defined as an integral over this closed curve along which we were transporting our system. Some vector field, a scalar product with dr. In turn, this, this term under the integral is called Berry connection, and it is defined by the derivatives of our wave function. M, number n, denotes here the respective energy band. And we can transform this expression, et cetera, et cetera. An important uh, statement is the following. So the integral of the Berry curvature over a closed two-dimensional surface can acquire only discrete set of values. And these uh, integers here, uh, which appear here, are called churn number. For each band, we, have diff we, we may have different values of the churn number. And finally, if you want to apply this machinery uh, for some uh, periodic systems, instead of this vector r, we can use the components of the wave vector. Is there any similar state with the real part? I think you have the i in front, which gives you the very curvature, but you also have the, um, I think, the quantum geometric part. Is there any similar state? Uh, thanks, Alexei, uh, for good question. So we will discuss a quantum geometric tensor for sure. Uh, so what is important is that uh, this quantity very connection is purely real. Uh, this becomes evident from the fact, I will use the whiteboard. So since our wave vector is, uh, our psi function is normalized, then if we take the derivative of this, we will get This would be equal to zero. 
so which means that let's say a n conjugated, which is minus i. So after applying this identity, we see that a Berry connection is purely real. That's why uh, at, at this point we don't see any 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 problems. Uh, quantum geometry tensor still doesn't pop up in, in this discussion, but we will see in this talk a bit later how how it appears naturally in the theory. Good. So uh, if we consider some periodic systems, we can use uh, k-vector as this parameter. And this construction is commonly used in solid-state physics. What is important, however, is that uh, these churn numbers, uh, these very curve, which is very connection, are not purely mathematical quantities which uh, are used only in some theoretical uh, discussions. They do have some observable manifestation. And one of very profound and famous manifestations uh, of uh, Berry curvature is related to the phenomenon of the so-called anomalous velocity. So let's imagine that we have electrons moving in a periodic potential. Uh, namely, we would expect that uh, the velocity of those electrons would be defined uh, by the derivative of their energy with respect to k. This is our naive expectation, which any undergraduate may have just from, from their uh, bachelor course. However, on top of that, in some situations, uh, velocity acquires an additional contribution. This contribution is perpendicular to the applied electric field. And this anomalous velocity was recently measured directly for some cold atom systems and so on. Uh, and as you see, uh, this additional term in the anomalous velocity is governed exactly by the Berry curvature. So the curl of Berry connection, which is written here on the Y. And you can immediately recognize or guess that uh, this anomalous velocity should be somehow related to quantum Hall effect. Because uh, as you know, uh, in Hall effect, you have current, it flows in the magnetic field, and then uh, there is a voltage which arises in the direction perpendicular to the current. So current and voltage are perpendicular, and the same story here. So E corresponds to the voltage, and the uh, velocity of electrons corresponds to the current. So by doing some relatively simple calculations, uh, we can immediately recognize uh, that the so-called uh, whole conductivity, which relates uh, voltage and current in the perpendicular directions, sigma x, y. Uh, so this whole conductivity is given by the following formula some constant, uh, and sum of all churn numbers of field electronic bands. And in this sense, we, we, we see that churn number has very simple and observable manifestation. And from here, we understand that, okay, first of all, we see that uh, whole conductivity is quantized, which is famous quantum hole effect, uh, marked by the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, in 1985. And secondly, what is important, since this guy is topological invariant, then even in the presence of some imperfections, even if our sample is, is not very good, still we, we should observe this quantization of whole conductance. And this was observed uh, in experiments, and I guess in 1980s, uh, such people as uh, Thales, Kamoto, Nightingale, uh, uh, and others came up with this topological interpretation of quantum pole effect. Now, uh, to understand a bit more, let, let us look, look up some very simple, very basic example where topological phases come into play. So the simplest example, of course, should be one dimension. So how do we define this topological invariant in one dimension? In one dimensional case, uh, we know that the brilliant zone spans the range in case space from minus pi divided by A to pi divided by a, where a is the period of the system, we can set it to unity. Importantly, these two ends of the brilliant zone are identical to each other, so they are equivalent, and as a result, our brilliant zone becomes ring. So we have a closed uh, manifold, and therefore we can uh, define in our invariant in 1D, we can integrate 
uh, over this closed manifold, and this is famous Zach phase. This is topological invariant. Uh, it's, it's defined modular to pi. Uh, unfortunately, it, in 1D, it's, it's not very, uh, it's, uh, there is less of uh, robustness compared to, to 2D case. So the Zach phase depends on the choice of, of the union cell. I can co comment on that later. And then if we have some symmetries, specifically inversion symmetry, the Zach phase is quantized, taking only two values, either zero or pi. And the latter case is called by people topological. So now, if we choose uh, our unit cell consistently with the termination of the lattice, the non-trivial value of the Zach phase means that we have some H state at the boundary. So this is the bulk boundary correspondence principle, uh, which was proved uh, by many people back in 1980s, 1990s, I guess. And accordingly, let's, let's look closer at the simplest one-dimensional topological model, which is known as Sushreffer figure model, which is schematically depicted here. So we have a one-dimensional lattice composed of identical sites, and there are some coupling amplitude between those sites. And we have two types of couplings. One of them is weak, shown by the blue line here, and one of them is uh, strong, uh, shown by the red, or maybe magenta line here. So let's see. Uh, first of all, it is straightforward to, to write the tight binding Hamiltonian. It's a completely trivial task. Uh, typically, I, I suggest this exercise to, to the uh, undergrad students who are just coming to my group. Then you can calculate the band structure, and importantly, uh, we see that there is a gap uh, in the spectrum. Uh, and also another interesting feature is that the spectrum is symmetric with respect to zero energy. This is guaranteed actually by certain symmetry of the structure. Specifically, there is an operator which anti-commutes with our Hamiltonian and due to this, for each eigenstate with, with some positive energy, we can easily construct another eigenstate having opposite so negative energy in this use. And by direct uh, examination, we can check that this system, uh, Sushri particular model, is characterized in terms of the non-zero invariant gamma, which takes value of pi, provided uh, we keep a weak link inside our unit cell. Good. Then uh, what happens if our structure is somehow terminated? So if we examine a finite structure, in that case, Block Hamiltonian is not sufficient. We need to write full Hamiltonian of this finite structure and then calculate the eigenstates which appear on this system. We get a lot of eigenstates. What is important, however, is that uh, besides those modes which are delocalized in the bulk of the system, we, get, we also recover an H localized mode having exactly zero energy. So it appears in the middle of the gap and it, it demonstrates exponentially Exponential localized. Um, it is exponentially localized. So the amplitudes of the wave function, this measures the probability of particles sitting in the first side. This is the probability of particles sitting in the second side, etc., etc. And these probabilities decay exponential. So, what is special about this H mode? How the topological origin of this uh, mode is manifested, let's say, in some experiments or third experiments. And to reveal uh, the features of topological protection, we consider the couplings in this array, which are slightly fluctuated. So we take our Hamiltonian and add random disorder to the couplings of our matrix. Of course, we have to make sure that our Hamiltonian still stays Hermitian. Uh, physically, this corresponds to the situation when we randomly move those sites such that their couplings are modified in a random manner. Then we do the simulations for the different strength of the disorder. So this measures the strength of the disorder uh, compared uh, to the initial periodic case. For each simulation, we calculate the modes of the structure. Uh, so the energies of those modes are shown by the blue points here. And then we, we do different realizations and plot them on this histogram. As you immediately see, the energies of all modes slightly fluctuate with the disorder. This is the expected behavior. However, there is a mode at the edge 
with the energy which doesn't fluctuate. It stays pinned to the, to the zero energy level, being protected by the symmetries of the system. And quite importantly, the distribution for this H mode features the same symmetry in, uh, as, as previously. In any, every second site, we have vanishing complete probability amplitude, field amplitude. So mm -hmm. the, the H mode still persists, it survives, survives the disorder. And this is a signature of some topological properties of this sushi Yeah, please, please. Yeah, uh, uh, for example, if you add the uh, disorder or vibration proportional to the sigma C, then the, uh, still the symmetry or topological property remains there. Unchanged. Good question. Uh, thank you for asking this question. So. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our H state is not uh, protected against any type of the disorder. As you correctly noted, if we break the underlying symmetry, of course, we cannot hope for topological protection. And this is exactly the topic of the next slide. So, I also ask a question yes. about the previous one. Uh, what if the disorder will be very strong and uh, some links of J1s be stronger than J2s? Well, change yeah. then, then uh, if you consider such uh, special situation, then of course those dots will be distributed in some weird way. However, our symmetry is guaranteed that you will still have uh, the mode with the zero energy. It will still feature this sort of distribution uh, uh, in a sense that in every second site, you will have vanishing complete. However, there is no guarantee generally that this distribution will be still decaying. So if you introduce a lot of disorder, these blue uh, uh, bars will be not decaying. But I you think about the topological green function. Green function. Yeah, without the uh, disorder, green function looks like the data function, right? right? That's a function of shape. Mm -hmm. But turn on the weak, very weak disorder, you make a little broadening, but topology does not change. But very strong, when disorder is very strong, this is some uh, split of the spectral wave. If it can be some possible, maybe, maybe you assume original non interacting pattern. Without disorder, green function times some the simple multiplication of G Z times some green function over non the without what the without the disorder plus uh, with the disorder green function plus uh, one over minus G and we G change of the zero to the one and similar to the automatic change and we, you can the, check the gap closing or something. Without gap closing, the topology is maybe almost same and that case well, must be just this is some surface state is still remain. But, but good, good, yeah, Th thank you. For, thanks a lot for the question or maybe even for the comment, I would say. Uh, so we didn't investigate the behavior of the green function. That's the first part. The second part, you're absolutely right, that when the gap does not close, you, you can hope that topological properties survive. However, is the, if the gap is closing, then probably something more dramatic would happen. However, if, if we're breaking the periodicity of the system, you know, it, it's hard to define what is, what is the band gap. So we have just points, some spacing between the points. Of course, we can make our inner radius. You calculate the three function in the super cell. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I guess that this could be useful uh, machinery for tracking this sort of, of behavior. So as of now, I would say that okay, we, we lose some localization when, when the disorder is applied. If the disorder is extremely strong, maybe something dramatic would happen. But in this domain, when your disorder does not exceed the value of the weakest coupling, you can still believe that. Uh, we still have the localized state, even though slightly distorted, as you can see on this graph. Yeah. I have a further question. Essentially, we're about the regime of very strong disorder. 
Uh, is there any connection between the strong dishonor of SSH and the dice? Oh, good question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm interested to find out. Basically, what I'm curious is that, well, here you had strong disorder, you would poke him, uh, you would no longer know which link is strong, which one is weak. But what I'm thinking is, well, just take J1 and J2, um, well, keep the values, whatever it is, like J1 is two times larger than J2, mm -hmm. but just make them say, well, you take plus or minus value. This would on one hand guarantee that you always have one link larger than the other, but in the case of the other hand, it would still be you know, a dice model, so you should have also zero energy states for the final localization. Yes, I should have zero energy state. Uh, the reversal of the sign of the coupling does not affect this conclusion. Uh, then the second thing, uh, we can consider negative couplings as well, so no problem here. The change will be in the band structure, so we will be at the uh, point of closing of the gap will be in some diff different position. So uh, there's, there's no, I mean, there's no uh, band structure because yes, it's just, it's yeah. Disordered. yeah. In the disordered case, of course, you, you cannot uh, talk about uh, the band structure. That, that's right. So the only thing uh, I, I can't say exactly right now is is about the degree of localization. So uh, how much it, it should be the same as the dice principle. We should have it should. Basically, plug to any from sample to sample. The average should be the square root of the distance. But um, basically, what I'm curious in principle, but on one hand, as this edge tells me the state should be localized at the edge. Mm -hmm. uh, but in Dyson model, I think it's really determined by where basically by the disorder. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not necessarily localized at the edge. That's what I'm curious. Yes, well, both, both, I mean, both Dyson model and SSH, it seems like it should be made compatible, but... Uh, yeah, so the localization could, localization could occur for strong disorders. Uh, and, 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 as you suggest, localization could occur, let's say, somewhere here, keeping, of course, chiral symmetry, so uh, zero in every second cavity, and keeping zero energy of the moon. That's... I don't see contradiction. That, that's possible. So you mean that the edge state not be localized edge? Yeah, at a certain point you can lose this property in this domain. So I cannot comment what's going on here because I did not investigate that. But it's it's likely what you are saying that we, we can get localization in some random point of the lattice depending on the particular realization of the disorder. And then I come back to, to your question. Uh, so there was a question, what happens if we introduce some other types of the disorder in the same SSH lattice? In particular, uh, let us perturb the eigenfrequencies of those sites. So each site is characterized by, by the eigenfrequency omega naught. We set it to zero in the previous calculations. And now we, we add some random disorder quantified by the magnitude delta omega. And you immediately see for different realizations of the disorder, we still get something localized at the edge, even for weak disorders, but even for weak disorders, the energy of that edge localized mode starts to fluctuate. This means that the underlying symmetries of our model are broken. And then if you go to stronger disorders, our edge mode completely disappears, falling in the continuum of the bulk mode. Uh, yeah. Um, can you not still preserve things if you make uh, on site disorder, but uh, force uh, it to change sign. Ah, so uh, yeah, I would I'm say. Thinking because I think that there are, I mean, in principle, uh, I think there might be ways to keep chiral symmetry with, with on site signs. So uh, yes, uh, I'm not yes, entirely yes. sure, but I'm, I'm thinking that maybe uh, forcing uh, the sign to be different or making that. Well, I, in general, I agree with you that introducing some correlated on-site disorder, we can ensure that the chiral symmetry is uh, maintained. So the only requirement we have is anti-commutation with sigma z operator. Uh, and then, well, probably in some special situations, we, we can keep chiral symmetry in. However, for, in terms of physical realization, you never have uh, some special correlated disorder. Uh, in essence, you have just random uh, contributions to the eigenfrequencies of those sites. Mm -hmm. So doing correlated disorder is, is somewhat special. But it, it is still interesting, uh, interesting situation.
And then we see that the symmetry of our H mode is broken. So you see that uh, we have non-vanishing amplitude in second, fourth uh, resonator. So in this sense, topological protection is lost. That's, that's the limits uh, of our uh, SSH physics. And then people, as you can guess, uh, when uh, people realized uh, this SSH stuff experimentally in multiple platforms, optical, plasmonic, polyritonic, uh, whatever platform exists, they, they, they uh, examined it. And then we were interested a couple of years ago, together with our collaborators from MIPT uh, in Moscow, we were interested to realize this sort of physics using superconducting qubits. Why? Well, superconducting qubits are promising candidates to realize future quantum computers. At least uh, IBM and Google are heavily investing in this direction, and there is an active uh, ongoing research. And one of the major problems with qubits is uh, the effect of First of all, uh, the effects of decoherence, some incoherent interactions with the environment, which cause the superposition states to transform into mixed states. This is bad enough, so people uh, try to, to fight with this, with this problem. And there is another major problem, which I'm not touching in this talk, is about error correction. So you are doing some quantum algorithms, and then you, may, you need to make sure that during this computation uh, protocol, uh, your system does not introduce any errors. And therefore, people are actually in this area of quantum technologies, people are quite interested in uh, introducing some protection to their system such that, uh, let's say, decoherence or uh, some other undesired processes are suppressed. And we, we were investigating this, this avenue uh, together with our collaborators. And as uh, as one particular studies, we realized Sushi Trotiger model uh, using the array of superconducting qubits. So you can consider a single superconducting transmon qubit as just a uh, harmonic os uh, as, as an oscillator, uh, LC resonator. But the essential part of this, this system is provided by the Josephson junction, which is tiny spot over here. Oh, yeah over here. And uh, in essence, Josephson junction can be viewed as nonlinear inductance. Uh, this renders the potential of a qubit unharmonic. So we see if we schematically draw uh, the effective potential, then the levels here will not be equidistant, which is captured by the additional term uh, in the Hamilton here. This sort of Hamilton, an, an approximate one, is called Baze Hubbard Hamiltonian. Uh, I guess many of you are familiar uh, with this thing. And we were solving for some elementary excitations in the system uh, described by the Baze Hubbard Hamiltonian, assuming some alternating couplings between the qubits, J1 and J2. So, and here we have, you, you see some experimental parameters. That's the parameters of, of our experimental sample. They correspond to the mi microwave spectral range. So, the main complication with those qubits is that you have to maintain extremely low temperatures of, the, of these systems at the level of tens or maybe 20 millikelvin, so 20 times 10 to the minus 3. So these are quite low temperatures, then you need special equipment, so and therefore not so many labs. Yes? So what do you mean by, so when you have transmon, so what do you mean by this J1 and J2, like you are taking only the lowest level, or... Because each transform you are mentioning that they have series of energy levels, right? Uh, good, I understood your question, so let, let me come. So you, you see that a single transmon is, is this cross. Then different transmons are coupled with each other using this so-called capacitive coupling. So if we write the circuit equations for this stuff, those capacitive couplings are translated exactly into these uh, terms in the Hamiltonian. Roughly speaking, uh, due to this connection between the qubits, you can transfer photons from here, or not photons, some elementary excitation from here to the adjacent qubit. On top of that, of course, you have a lot of other stuff. For instance, this blue line is used to uh, control the frequency of the qubit, because you need to, to make sure that all your qubits have identical resonance frequency. This line is used to, to redoubt the number of photons in the qubit, and then there is a whole science uh, 
how you measure the number of photons in qubit, but your measurement should not affect uh, uh, the number of photons. Photons are electrons. Well, let, let's say exit, the number of excitations, yeah. Uh, and this is ensured due to the so-called dispersive coupling between the qubit and redoubt resonator. So it's, you know, it's, it's a big uh, topic, and I, I'm not a big expert in that. Uh, but still, we understood uh, this to, to a decent amount in order to, to interpret the experimental data. Very good. Since we realized uh, uh, that we have a sushi particular model of, of those transmons, we expect the dispersion exactly as we discussed with you. In the yeah. previous slide, you showed some numbers, and uh, I wonder whether you have some dispersion in coupling frequencies. Because here you have dispersed some like uh, scattering uh, F plus, F of plus, and then you have some like exact numbers for other quantities. Ah, yeah, good. Thank you for the question. So let me comment on that. So it, uh, the, 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 this thing means that we, we can set in experiments all qubits to 3.73. In other experiments, uh, for the reasons I will explain a bit later, we set all qubits to 3.82. So we don't have much uh, spread in, in the eigenfrequencies because there is a special control lines shown here by the blue, which allow you to, to ensure that the frequencies of all qubits are identical. Oh, okay, so it's not a disorder, it's just yeah, yeah. what you choose in your real experiment. Yes, uh, so in microwaves, you, you can you have actually a lot of control on those qubit eigenfrequencies. Uh, while these couplings could be engineered, because when you bring this stuff on the chip, you have some control on the magnitude of capacitances inserted here. And uh, the guys uh, we were collaborating with, they, they were quite confident that we have um, more or less precise values of the couplings. And this is verified in the subsequent measurements. I have a question. Is it, is it to or should it touch the same phase? Uh, is it easy to we are make a uh, all qubit at the same phase? You use not all neglect the phase of in the qubit. So, so you mean the, the, the same uh phase or the, the, the same F? No, the same phase you think about the uh, you are all A all A is the same, right? You use write down the all A, not the exponential as by something. Uh -huh. It means the all exactly the qubit has the same phase. So. Well, but to, to do this, as you suggested, there are some standard operations which yeah. flip the qubit from state zero to state one. So we can readily prepare them all in excited state. Well, not, not easily, but this is done. But uh, this is uh, only one excited unit. Measure the movement of the excitation, right? Not the two, two, two excitation. Uh, how to call it? I don't know. Uh, okay, okay. Think so, about the photon. So, the one photon is uh, yeah, moving, yeah, right? Yeah, but yeah, how to control it? Maybe I understood your question now. So, you're asking uh, if we are solving a problem with single excitation, then yeah, th yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, yeah. yeah, but uh, during the transfer, they do not change over any phase. No, 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 no. You, you, you just adjust the parameters of the system and then you do the measurements. So you don't do, uh, because adjusting something is relatively slow process, while propagation of the photon or some excitation of the array is, is relatively fast process. That's why there is no sense in, uh, how to say, in rotating the knob during the experiment. It's the best way to spoil something. I, I was having a question also. What is quantized in this system? Because you are referring to some harmonic oscillators. So, yeah, good. This is due to superconductivity. Due to the of yes, something. yes. Uh, this quantum stuff appears due to the Josephson junctions, uh, due to superconductivity. And essentially, this boils down to, to, to Cooper pairs and stuff like that. Uh, and that's why. Uh, so, if we are discussing single excitations propagating in the system, we adopt this uh, quantized description. So, but if we have this transmon isolated, we just have, have some LC counter where we have some uh, some oscillating electric current. Yes, a sort of that. 
So these oscillations are not persistent, of course. You will be in the, if we isolate the trans one and put no energy there, our system will be in the ground state. In the ground state, as you know, even in harmonic oscillation, you have some vacuum sort of fluctuations. Yes. So, but, but when you calculate the averages, of course, the averages will do not. Okay, and, and if we have higher current, so it will mean that we are moving to second excited states? Yes, roughly speaking, yes. So, uh, in, a, in a sense, we are quantizing our circuit uh, because we can launch those quantized excitations there. Uh, the temperature is kept low. Uh, the interaction with the environment can be neglected. So, it's, it's sort of uh, conditions needed for, for, for quantum description of this system. All right, so then uh, I explained to you that the dispersion which we can expect, this can be readily calculated using the coupling, uh, coupling amplitudes and using the transmog frequencies as we uh, explained. Now, what happens if we excite our array of transmogs? Because in experiment, you don't measure the eigenmodes themselves. You measure how your system responds to the excitation. Let's just consider the situation when you excite uh, the system at the edge with the strong coupling. So th this one is strong. Then, of course, you couple to the bulk modes, and then you observe some characteristic peaks in all this frequency band, which corresponds to the bulk modes. So this is numerical simulation. Very nice. Then, if we instead uh, couple to the right edge of area where we have weak coupling, mean, then we are assumed to excite our topological edge mode. And therefore, we observe a profound peak in the middle of the gap. Because of some incoherent processes, it, it is broadened a little a bit. So and it is centered around the frequency 3.8 gigahertz. Then we compare these results uh, with experimental data, because in experiment you can obviously repeat these bumps of the left and right edges, and there we get these curves. Uh, of course, with, with a bit of noise, but the general picture is clear. So if you excite the left edge, you couple to the bulk modes, shown here. If you excite the right edge, you couple to the edge mode, as shown by the red peak uh, over there. Moreover, by measuring, by fixing the frequencies uh, corresponding to this peak, you can measure the population of different qubits in their way. And in this sense, you can sort of reconstruct the profile of the H mode and get this histogram, uh, more or less matching the theory, even though there are some differences related to the population of qubit number 10. So, so yes. So is this uh, mode is the topological mode protected by current symmetry because this is like odd number of sites. So, um, uh, yeah, so let me quote. First, uh, we consider odd number of sites in order to have access to both types of termination of the array, right? Because at one edge we have weak coupling, thing, the other, at another edge we have strong coupling. So that's, uh, that's convenient. Now, uh, what I'm claiming is that the mode sitting here on the weak link edge is exactly the topological state expected in the source rate for trivial model. It's not affected by the fact whether you add or cut some resonator here. It doesn't matter actually because it's it's perfectly localized uh, at this position. Yes, so we, we are probing single photon topological H mode. There is not, no surprise here because people we are probing this topological stuff in many other platforms as well. Yeah, so what did you do in the numerical uh, simulation? Here, B, uh, so uh, to, to get panel B, we are solving uh, equations for the density matrix, Lindblad equations, introducing some dissipation and introducing some excitation either here or here. And uh, we extract, as a result of calculation, we can extract the number of photons in our system. Because it's, it's like, uh, it's very similar to the problem. You have an array of harmonic oscillators, you apply it somewhere mm -hmm. towards, and you measure how much energy you you put in the system depending on the driving frequency. That's what it's the, it's the total number of the regenerator. Uh, it's 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 overall photon number in the entire array. In the entire array. In the same way as you have a, a, an array of oscillators, you you put some force, you excite by force, and depending on the frequency, you get 
uh, larger or smaller amplitude of oscillations. Thanks. So, yeah, uh, importantly, importantly, uh, uh, the number of the photons in this sort of measurement is not conserved because you, you have excitation, uh, so the energy is transferred. I see that uh, yeah. you saw the uh, array of the transmon, uh, not the, uh, the average number of the photon of the resonator. Yes, we are solving the problem for the entire array of transmons. Then we calculate the number of uh, photons in, in this array. Uh, and that's uh, essentially, this is based on the equations for the density, density networks, blind blood equations. But the experimental data, sorry, the, uh, what they measure? The, uh, the number of photons. Uh, in, experiments, uh, in experiments, they measure uh, well, in experiment, of course, you don't have a lot of access to, to all the resonators. Yeah. You measure either the number of photons here or the number of photons here and adapt those contributions. So it's it's not uh, it's not measuring every transform. That's possible, but technically hard. So to get qualitatively mm -hmm. measured the data, here, here they, they have an access to measurement, maybe a couple of transforms. I guess for this data, they were measuring this and this. For this, for this data, they were measuring this, this, and this. So just a couple of transmits. Uh, because the main limitation in these qubit architectures, why people can't make quantum computer right now? There are multiple reasons. One of them is that you need some control and measurement lines for each qubit. So for each qubit, you have you need to have a lot of electrons, which complicates life. Good. So then so, we were. Yeah. I have a question about the previous slide and. Is it on the right side of the slide there is a plot where there is a, like a symmetrical difference between experiment and theory? When on 10 qubit on an experiment something appears and in theory there is nothing, and, uh, isn't that a big problem for theory or not really? Well, uh, of course, as we were discussing with you a couple of slides ago, uh, if, if you have SSH model, then in every second uh, site, you have zero output. An experiment tells us that we have some something non-zero here. So we spend some time trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, so obviously, some underlying symmetry is broken, but why? Uh, the most plausible explanation for that is that there are some uh, incoherent processes going on in this system. So you have decoherence and dissipation. Those guys break the symmetries of our uh, of our model, and due to that, it's no surprise that you get something non zero here. Yeah. Of course, the, the main question uh, can you use topology to protect against decoherence? I don't know. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a more complex question than, uh, than we answered uh, in this work. Right. What we were uh, interested in how you can utilize the, the, this topological stuff. Can you get at least any sort of advantage in this system? And we were inspecting what happens if you have some disordering the couplings, <coughs> and, and we do, and we consider certain measurements. So you excite the array from this uh, from this position, and you measure the number of the photons in the same side. So what's uh, this is called transmission, so so-called transmission. Then. Uh, you scan the frequency, and depending on the frequency, uh, in some uh, at some frequencies you have characteristic minima associated with the fact that your signal couples to the bulk modes of the array, and energy goes from here to the entire array. And obviously, depending on the strength of the disorder, those characteristic curves shift. So disorder affects the result. However, if you excite the array on the right edge, where, where the topological edge mode sits, the results for this transmission coefficient essentially do not depend on the strength of the, of the disorder, so the spectra do not shift, and this is uh, uh, a fingerprint of topological protection. Uh, in, in this case, so what it's kind of disorder? Uh, disorder in the couplings. Yeah. So this is the simulation. In simulation, you can easily put a lot of disorder in the couplings. Uh, in experiment, uh, for each realization of the disorder, you need to do another uh, another sample. This, this is much more demanding. Good. And then maybe I will, uh, since we have some limited time, 
We were also investigating two photon excitation in this system. Solving for two photon excitation is, is a bit harder task uh, because then you, you are playing games with this Baza Hubbard model. Some bad ones are method, it, it works, but analytics appears to be cumbersome. So uh, the bottom line here is that we have theoretical prediction for the two photon H localized topological state. However, uh, the, the expectation is that this H state is too close to the bulk band. So in our experiments, we were not able to resolve those two photon topological excitation. And you cannot actually reach with this sample three photon regime, because when, when you get three photons in the system, actually the system burns out. That's, that's the, 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 the level of power needed to absorb something three fold. So and basically, in this case, you diagonalize a Hamiltonian grid to, you assume that you have two photons. Yes. Yes, it, it's sort of separate story. It was a separate theoretical work, I guess dated back to 2017, where we managed to find excitations, two photon excitations in the system. And actually there are two types of two photon excitations. Maybe I, I should write something for the two work more, more specific. So in the two photon sector, you present the wave function in the following form. Uh, it's actually some, uh, so you assume that one, one photon or one excitation sits at the site with number M, another photon sits at the site with number N, and there are some few proposition conditions. To visualize the respective distribution, you basically plot a map of this beta MN coefficient. This is the two dimensional map. Then, uh, depending on the uh, structure of this map, we can identify different types of the two photon states. One of the types is when all pixels here are shining brightly. This means some delocalized two photon excitation. This is not super equal. The situation when the spots at the diagonal are shining brightly means that the two photons tend to sit together because m equal to m. And this is so-called bound, uh, bound photon pairs. So we predicted them, and actually in these experiments, we were observing them indirectly. So these dispersion curves actually correspond to bound photon pairs, whereas uh, these uh, scattering states of two photons are further a higher in frequency, I guess. So they're separated in frequency. Finally, there are some situations, which I'm highlighting here, or here, this is the calculation, when uh, these beta MN coefficients, superposition coefficients, uh, have the maximum at the diagonal of this distribution and also on, at the corner. And this corresponds to the situation when our two photons stick together and sit at the edge of the system. And we were investigating them quite for some time, and we were able to show that they're also sort of topological, protected by some symmetries of the system. Uh, however, we were not observing them in this qubit experiment just because of this small gap. So later we found out what should be modified to push them in the center of the gap, but it was too late. The sample was fabricated. Yeah, quite unfortunate. Fine, and then we were doing a lot of theoretical work together with my former student, Andrei Stepanenko. Now he's uh, a fellow uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, so how you can play with these uh, transmogs in order to get different types of Hamiltonians. So one of the interesting possibilities is to insert some auxiliary harmonic resonators between the two qubits. And it actually gives you an interesting modification of the effective Baza Hubbard Hamilton. As we showed in our theoretical paper published a couple of years ago, uh, as a result of this insertion, we can get actually additional term in the Hamiltonian called density dependent coupling, which means that uh, this term describes uh, the destruction of excitation in one side and transfer of this excitation to another side. But the amplitude of this uh, probability is proportional to the sum of populations in the adjacent side. So this mechanism is called density dependent coupling. And we were also uh, sort of investigating theoretically what sort of physics can be obtained due to the density dependent coupling. This is all interesting. I, I skipped this theoretical part. And recently, we came up with, with some suggestion for two dimensional 
array of superconducting qubits. So if, if you incorporate actually Josephson, Josephson junctions, not only in the transman qubits, but also in the couplings between them, we can actually engineer some interesting Hamiltonians containing a mixture of uh, uh, care type interaction, uh, density dependent coupling, direct to photon coupling, etc. And we, we have relatively flexible control of all additional terms arising in the Hamiltonian, which together would enable topologically protected core movement. And I'm proud to say that we published this in 2022 uh, in, in physical review lectures. This was a big theoretical work. And now we are discussing with some exper experimentalists how, how we can try to, uh, to implement this fascinating physics experiment. Uh, can you go to the previous slide? Yes, please. Uh, previous one. Uh -huh. uh, so the... Um, Density uh, dependent uh, tunneling here is this you couple the left and right with C and then you integrate out the degree of freedom of C and effectively get this. Uh... Yes, yes, uh, you're absolutely right. So the idea here is that we insert the auxiliary resonator, but its frequency is detuned from the main frequency of transition in a transmon, both single photon and two photon transition. Uh, due to this detuning, we can apply perturbation theory, excluding the redundant degrees of freedom. And in this effective description, we arrive to the uh, effective density dependent coupling. So that's uh, the technical side how, how this is done. And actually, I guess- uh, So T is like J1 squared or something like Yes, that. yes. So it's, uh, oh, I didn't write the amplitude. It's, it's proportional to J1 squared divided by delta. So you, you have the control of, uh, of the detuning, of course, but it should be large enough in order to, to keep uh, the perturbation theory applicable. And then we were also uh, discussing how, how the transfer between the two qubits happens. So first you use auxiliary resonator to store one photon, and then this photon is transferred to the uh, next qubit, and therefore you get square here. Yeah. And another essential ingredient for, for effective density dependent coupling is the unharmonicity of the qubit potential. So that's, that's also important. Sorry. The, uh, question in this, uh, yeah, is the slide, do you consider a single uh, uh, No, here we, we consider, in order, to, if you are interested in these sort of terms, then you need to consider not only single, uh, uh, particle excitation, but also two particle excitation. So that's the the subspace we are investigating. I, I mean, uh, if you do some approximation in the house, I may expect to see some a dagger, a dagger, a type of forms that a dagger squared, a squared, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, these terms uh, could appear, uh, not in this particular setting, but you, you can get them. So uh, in our let me, let me show. In our two-dimensional system, we get exactly these sort of uh, uh, contributions you are mentioning. Uh, and all of them are controlled by the parameters of, of the circuit we assemble. And then the game we are playing here by introducing these additional terms. So first of all, we, we demonstrated how you can engineer that. And secondly, we showed that uh, it is possible to realize the situation when in the single photon regime, the system is topologically trivial, no corner states, nothing. Then you put the second photon in the system and topological states suddenly, all of a sudden appear because of the interplay with these terms. So that, that, that was our prediction. Nice physics, but uh, experimentalists are saying that this is not, not that easy to implement. So we have to, to further, uh, to do some further work. Very good. And now this brings me to the to the second part, which I, I hope to, to at least to briefly cover, because we were doing this topological phases, all, all, all this stuff for a long time. I guess we started to do this back in 2015 or something, when I still was a PhD student. But the entire concept of varied phases assumes a diabetic evolution. And I always had a question well, for myself, what happens if the evolution is not a diabetic? And this brings us to the question asked by Alexei in the beginning of the talk. 
Because intuitively, we could expect that the geometry of quantum states should still play some role, even if the evolution is non-adiabatic. And we are lucky that the necessary framework is already created by mathematicians. Mathematicians know this stuff as Fubini study metric. Uh, physicists call this quantum geometric tensor. And uh, this topic recently started to gain a lot of attention of the community. For instance, if you open the web page of PRL, uh, at the end of 2023, they introduced a novel format of essays. And there was uh, an essay, where can quantum geometry lead us? And they, they summarized that many physical phenomena could be could benefit from, from using these geometric constants. And there were some examples. So how do we define geometric quantum tensor? So imagine we have uh, some system, some quantum system. The state depends on the set of the parameters. Uh, the same story as with very phase. And then we want to construct some tensor, which sort of quantifies the distance between different quantum states. Most, the simplest uh, approach to do that would be to take derivative of our psi with respect to certain parameters, lambda nu, lambda nu, and construct this scalar product, just this scalar product. However, uh, you immediately recall that if you construct some quantity, it's, it's good if it is gauge invariant, because otherwise, if it is gauge dependent, you can hardly connect this to some observables. And, and in order to have this gauge independent quantity, we add this, this second contribution. And then when you do gauge transformations, you can show that uh, the contributions from the first and the second term mutually cancel, and the standard appears to be gauge invariant. Interestingly, so I studied general relativity. In general rel relativity, you have purely real and symmetric uh, metric, metric tensor. However, quantum geometric tensor contains both real and imaginary contribution. So if you take the imaginary part, you get the recurvature. So exactly the thing we discussed with you in the first part of the talk. And roughly speaking, from you know, physical level of rigor, uh, this, this defines some synthetic gauge field in the momentum space. I, I can give the variation is sometimes uh, just the uh, normalized is uh, sometimes broken. So uh, there is a reason many people write down the denominator is uh, whatever. You assume this is by the size is a normalized wave function, right? Yes, so psi is, is a normalized wave function. But the derivative of the, the psi is sometimes change over the... Yeah, there, there could be some singularities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a reason we are, we are write down the, some the Lagrangian multiplier to change over some adiabatic change. So that means the Geometric tensor has also influenced the this diagram uh, multiplier. Well, of course, uh, if we have some singularities uh, in, let's say, in very phase, they are inherited by quantum geometric tensor. That's true. Typically, those singularities are associated with well, can be rooted to some topological phenomena as well. Uh, let's let's move on for the moment. I'll, I'll be happy to take some more questions after the talk, just, just to you know to, to draw a big picture at least. But but luckily uh, this tensor also has a real part. So we have something more than just the usual very phase, which we discussed within an hour with you. But there is a real part, and this defines a metric in the projective space. So what is projective space? Uh, is is the space which you get after taking Hilbert space and throwing away all the information about the global phase of the wave function. So roughly speaking, you, you consider the states psi and psi times I alpha equivalent. So they are denoted by the same point in the projective space. It's the same, the same point in the projective space. And with this convention, uh, the real part of quantum geometry tensor defines a metric in, in the projective space. And this would be very useful in, in different problems of quantum uh, 
optimization, time optimal control. And now I would like to briefly mention the problem we are solving with my students and colleagues right now. Uh, so we, we denote in this projective space by the point certain state of quantum system. The global phase is not important. And then we are interested in the following question. Imagine that you have certain Hamiltonian where you have specific restrictions. For instance, the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian cannot be larger than, than this value. Then uh, your system should always be tight binding, so you have no long rich coupling. And given these constraints, you want to transfer your quantum system from one state to another state within the minimal possible time. So, uh, interestingly, the velocity of motion in this projective space is given by the, by the following formula. Uncertainty of energy of the quantum system divided by the Planck's constant. And indeed, if you are dealing with the stationary state, during the time, the stationary state evolves such that only phase appears. And therefore, it's the same point of the projective space. And the line element in this description, in this simple pictorial description, is given exactly by the quantum measure. And so we were solving the problem. Uh, how do you transfer uh, the system between the two given states within the minimal possible time? And that's the problem of optimal control. So uh, obviously people investigated a lot these problems of time optimal control, uh, and there is a variational approach to this problem. So you write a functional, like action in classical mechanics, which is which corresponds, you divide the line element in this uh, projective space by the velocity of motion, which is delta E. And you require uh, the time to be minimal given a set of constraints. These constraints ensure that our system satisfies the usual Schrodinger equation. Uh, they restrict the matrix uh, elements of the Hamiltonian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then doing the variation with respect to those parameters gives us the set of equations of motion. So it's it's it's, it's really fascinating for me that uh, using these geometric concepts, you can solve some useful uh, quantum problems. And then the specific problems we were working on is, is very simple, but, well, the formulation is simple, but the solution is highly non-trivial. So imagine that we have an array of coupled qubits, uh, only nearest neighbor couplings, but the, uh, the degree of freedom which you have, you can vary the couplings between the qubits in time as you wish. And we, we restrict that uh, the sum of squares of those couplings should be constant, so you have only one degree of freedom. How should I choose, uh, how should I change my couplings in time in order to bring given initial state, single photon sitting on the left edge, to the given final state, single photon sitting on the right edge? What is the optimal protocol? And these tasks appear to be quite non trivial, because first of all, getting fidelity equal to one, so making a perfect transfer of the single photon from the left to the single photon on the right is quite non-trivial. Any arbitrary protocol would not work. And then finding minimum time is also non-trivial. So it's kind of non-trivial squared problem. First of all, let me show you by simple argument that it is possible for a arbitrarily long array to transfer this single photon from left to the right. Indeed, the simplest scenario which works is the following. First, you switch all odd couplings, J1. Your photon goes from here to here after you wait certain time. Then you switch these couplings off and turn on those couplings, J2. Then your photon, since this, uh, this coupling is switched off, the only option left for your photon is to go here. And this happens within this time, pi divided by 2J0. Then you switch the first couplings and the photon goes here, and so on, and so forth. In this way, you get this time of transfer. Very good, you get, you get fidelity equal to one. However, generally, this solution is not optimal. So it's not the fastest. Obviously, it's, it's not the best way of, of tra transporting a photon. Then, if it is possible, then we probably can use our operational algorithm and try to solve at least for some specific cases. For two qubits, 
Two qubits coupled with a single coupling, so nothing to optimize. The best answer is to, to make the coupling as large as possible and wait for, for this time. So completely trivial. But already for three qubits, three qubits, the solution appears to be non-trivial. So how should I change those couplings in time in order to, to achieve the fastest possible transfer? And then we were able to write those equations and to solve them. Uh, it's not that easy even for three qubits. We spent quite some time on that. And then the solution appears to be uh, simple and elegant. So we have to change our couplings according to cosine and sine functions. So the first coupling is initially it's, it's very big, but then it is gradually decreasing. And then the second coupling in parallel gradually increases according to sine function. So, and then you choose these frequencies, omega, not arbitrary, because you want fidelity equal to one. You choose them equal to J naught divided by the square root of three. Remember, J naught is sum of squares of my And so the whole, uh, yeah. Uh, do, do you have a proof that it is the uh, exact solution? Or it's yes, yes, yes. It, it's uh, also analytically, uh -huh. so it, it's the best and it is exact. So, Luckily, for three qubits, I can do that. So. And then the whole evolution is nicely solved analytically. And as expected, this, this approach beats stepwise algorithm by the entire 13%. So we can expect that there is a room for improvement for longer arrays. Well, uh, for 13%, for I'm joking. But uh, I mean, uh, obviously, if you have a longer array, uh, there is a room for improvement. But the optimal solution is hard to find, and we are still struggling. So we have some results, but uh, too preliminary to show them at this stage. But I believe generally this is very nice uh, concept that using this geometric language, using uh, the approaches, the approach of quantum geometric tensor and some relational techniques, you can actually optimize some quantum evolution. And this is the direction we are actively looking into. Because we were working a lot with very cases, but we never paid attention to the quantum geometry tensor, which in itself is very, very useful point. So concluding my talk uh, today, I would like to mention the things we, which I'm doing during my visiting appointment here at, uh, at IBS. So I'll be staying for approximately four or more weeks. So plenty of time to do something, to have some productive discussions. So uh, specifically, we were looking into some model also topological one, uh, consisting of a lattice of multi-mode waveguides with, with the degenerate modes. And we observed that for some particular parameters, you can achieve all flat bands in the spectrum. And we are discussing together with Alexei, together with uh, Sergei, uh, some possibilities uh, for this system. Uh, so how do you construct some compact localized states? What are their properties? Uh, is there any possible generalization towards three-dimensional systems, for instance? So we are very much interested in that stuff, especially given that the audience, uh, the members of this center, are big experts in quantum physics. So that there could be some fruitful collaboration in that direction. I will be happy to discuss this further uh, in any format with you. And another nice idea, which we were discussing the other day with Tung, is about uh, the topological characterization of these systems, because we found out that the system of multi-mode waveguides features somewhat unconventional topological properties, not captured by the existing classification. And we were very much interested to, to understand that better, because that, that might be a novel class of topological systems with all, with all the implication and consequences. And we, we were working on some field theoretical description of this physics, and I'm also very much interested to, to advance that direction uh, during my stay here. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to some discussions. Uh, you, you can catch up with me here. I'm sitting not far away, visitor office. Yes, and thank you for listening to me more than one hour. Thanks. Thank you, Maxim, for this excellent presentation. We have time for a few more questions, if there are. Good, I guess we had a loss during the talk. <laughs>
May may I ask you question? Uh, question that uh, in this the, in your uh, theoretical model for this the array of the transmit, you include is the higher energy levels the uh, with this harmonicity yeah. delta. Uh, my opinion that uh, one can attempt to uh, solve the same problem with the lowest uh, two level model. Uh, so, well, for each particular transmit, yes, as you are mentioning, we have like those levels zero, one, and two. Yeah, and importantly, we have some harmonicity. So, if this frequency is omega zero, then this frequency should be omega zero plus or more precisely minus delta. So, it, it's more two omega. In, in right. your uh, uh, calculation, the, uh, is the uh, higher level is important? I, I mean, the, the third? If you, yes, if you approximate the, uh, your uh, stage that they lose the two levels and uh, just the model a uh, single qubit for each uh, transmit, then the, some uh, fit with the experimental data uh, get increased. Uh, yes, uh, uh, good question, thank you. So if I approximate, because as everybody knows, qubit is a two-level system. So uh, the question is what happens if we neglect the, this level and consider only it? Yes. Then I uh, completely lose the information about the two photon transitions. So in this system, all characteristic frequencies will be either omega zero or proportional to omega zero. Yes. However, uh, what I know for sure is that there are some resonances in my system at the frequencies to omega minus delta. And I completely lose this information about the two photon transitions. So in experiment, we can probe for sure uh, those two photon transitions. That's what we observe. So it's, yeah, so neglecting this level of the transmits gives the discrepancy with experimental data. Yeah. For, for example, for example, the frequencies of those modes Precisely, well, they correspond to these uh, two photon transitions. Nice. Yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming, guys. Thank you for a lot of insightful questions. Yes. Okay. If there are no further questions, I have another question. Uh, just would you uh, go through that uh, geometric quantum? Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. I just take some notes. Yeah, please, please, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, because that's that's really useful concept. We yeah. discovered for ourselves that that was a big pleasure for you. Yeah, yeah, and the next next slide. Yeah, whatever you <laughs> anything. And so the presentation will be available. Our YouTube channel. Okay, so uh, with that, let us thank Maximo again. Okay.